We're just reading this one verse, Revelation 2, verse 11. Here we go. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Now it's interesting that Revelation chapter 2 and 3 are devoted to this term, overcoming. Now, when we, when we think that two chapters, two chapters of the Bible, especially of the last book, ha have been devoted to this one topic. Now, there are 22 chapters in the book of Revelation, a very critical book, a book that preempts everything that went before it. This is the final revelation, the final statement of God. It's the only book of the New Testament that claims to be a pure vision, a pure revelation of Jesus Christ. And I believe that it is. But yet, of two of these 22 chapters, the emphasis is on overcoming. Now, if when you start with the first century and you come on through and you look at the different doctrines that have come to the church, the one thing, it seems, that Satan, when, when you get into the realm of error, that Satan pushes more than anything else, more than anything else, and we see it coming up today, is this concept that the saint is not responsible for his redemption. That one way or another, it will proceed without his effort. Now, this is very important because you can see all kinds of shades of it uh, in church doctrine that somehow by one way or another whether it's an overemphasis on grace whether it's the rapture uh, whether it's irresistible grace or un unconditional love or whatever it may be the attack of Satan is on this one idea of the responsibility of the individual is he obligated to make an effort in his own redemption? And if so, how critical is this effort? And you would be amazed, you would be amazed at the number of Christian people, by far the, most major, the majority of evangelicals, by far the majority of evangelicals, who have been taught <coughs> that they are not critically responsible this is approached in many different ways, but it is very, uh, very strong, and, and it's, it is the opposite of what we teach. I want you to know that. In fact, we, I was notified today that uh, one family that's been getting the tapes wrote, and, and they're on the East Coast, and said, uh, we're attending the vineyard now, and we don't want your tapes anymore. So whether this, whether this doctrine is throughout the vineyard or not, I don't know. Uh, I, I suppose the same thing could have been said for many other churches. But I'm mentioning names to show you that we are in contradistinction to what other people are teaching. And the germ, the nucleus of the difference, is not on the blood atonement. It's not on the resurrection of Jesus. It's not on the fact that Christians are supposed to be good people. It's not on the fact that there's a heaven or that there are angels, as the Sadducees and the Pharisees used to argue about the angels and the resurrection from the dead. None of these things are questioned. We have all this in common with evangelical people. The fact, and most evangelicals believe that God wants people to be saved and they can be saved if they come to Jesus. We believe that. So all this is in common, but there is one point that is a wall as high and as thick as the wall of the New Jerusalem. And that is we teach in this church that in order to gain the rewards that we normally associate with the Christian, that is the crown of life, the presence of God, uh, the robe of righteousness, that we must do this thing called overcoming. And that that overcoming requires a balance in work. Now, this is important to understand. 
a balance, a balance between the sovereignty and the finished work of Jesus and the effort of the individual. We're not teaching that you do it all yourself. You try to do it all yourself, you will find that eventually you'll get discouraged and you will feel, you know, I, I can't do this, you know, hold on and this will happen and strive in this direction and that will happen. We don't teach that. We don't teach that here. We teach a balance and we've said through the years that we teach a balance to know when to rely on Christ's final and total victory, his overcoming strength in his life, the things that he has done, the finished work of Calvary is important for us to understand and grasp. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot do anything apart from Jesus. Praise the Lord. But that is only half of it. If you take that leg of the paradox, and, and most scripture doctrines are couched in paradoxes, whether it's faith and works, or whether it's election or free will, or whether it's the work of Christ and the work of the human. Most scriptural things are presented in paradoxes that appear to us to be inconsistent. And, and our tendency as human, as human beings, if we don't understand something, is to take the part we want and, and, and waltz around the other. If we believe in works, then we waltz around the faith. If we believe in faith, then we waltz around James. If we believe in the election really strongly, we waltz around he that comes to me. If we believe it totally in, you know, that it's whosoever will, then we waltz around election and forget Romans uh, chapters 9 and 10. And that is our tendency. These, uh, these paradoxes in the Bible, uh, the ten and, and a paradox has two legs. And if you cut off one, then truth falls. Do you see that? It, truth becomes error. And, and, and the idea of grace as, as uh, opposed to, say, presenting our body a living sacrifice, see, the tendency is to, is to accent one and minimize the other. Do you see that? And the Bible's full of such paradoxes. And denominations are built by taking one leg of a paradox and then explaining away the other. Instead of taking the whole word of God at full power, do we believe we're justified by works? Yes. Paul says we're justified by works. Do, uh, I mean by faith. Do we believe we're justified by works? Yes. James says, you see that how by works a man is justified. It states that clearly in the second chapter of James. But we say, how can this be? So instead, of, and yet we say we believe the word, so instead of saying if God says we're justified by faith and God says we're justified by works, then they obviously both must be true whether or not we understand it. If we say that we believe in election from the foundation of the world and we also believe that him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out, our brain may not see any reconciliation here, but that's not the issue. The issue is not whether we understand the Bible. The issue is, is the Bible the word of God? That's the issue. Or is only the part that we understand and accept the word of God? How do you treat the word of God? Brother Ellenwood used to say uh, about uh, the bride uh, in the Song of Solomon, it mentions her teeth and they're evidently perfect and they're like sheep that are brought up from the washing. Everyone is, 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 is pure white and she's not missing any. And he used to make quite a thing out of that, that that was so that when she ate something, <laughs> you know, if you try to eat corn on the cob and you've got three front teeth missing, it leaves part of the corn there on the cob. You see what I'm saying? And he used to make quite a point of that. But there's a lot of truth in that. There's a lot of truth in that. We, the bride has perfect teeth, and she takes the whole word. Debbie got marked down because she put, we're saved by both faith and works. Well, that is easily proven from the scripture, yet the teacher marked her down because in her school they have taken one leg of the paradox, deduced from it, saying that's what we believe, and they take the other, and then they explain it away, and explain it away, and explain it away. Well, anyway, uh, th this is a heavy thing today. This is a heavy thing. It's, it's springing up. That, uh, and I think the reason that this concept that, um, that Jesus did it all, taking that one leg of the paradox, 
talking of his tremendous finished work <coughs> and saying this is all there is, has two, there's, uh, Satan has two motives in that. Two motives in cutting off the part that we do, the overcoming that we do. Not the overcoming that Jesus did, but the overcoming that we do is neglected. One reason is that uh, we can see it in the case of the Jews in the Holocaust. Now, Deuteronomy, I don't know uh, how many have ever read the curses on Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. Have you ever, ever read those in the Old Testament? They're frightful. They're frightful. And I'll tell you this, the length of curses is two or three times as long as the length of blessings. And it's usually that way in the Bible that the negative outweighs the positive. And Doug and I were talking about that, and he had a very good point on that, Doug Bellamy. He said the balance is not that the negative and the positive are presented equally in the Bible. The balance comes when the negative is way overstressed in the positive because of our rebellious nature. For God to present a balanced word, he has to put much more stress on the negative. And Doug had some very interesting examples of that, of exhortations in the New Testament that were like three negative and then one positive. And it's certainly true in the blessing and cursing on Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim that uh, the list of curses far outweighs the list of blessings. Well, preachers and rabbis do not like to face a, a congregation and say, if you don't serve God, you're going to be eating your own children and, and so, and gross things, and gross things. I won't even say here while there's children here. Terrible things, terrible. Now, you think a rabbi is going to stand up and say that in the synagogue? But that's what God said. And then when the Holocaust came, do you know the reaction? There is no God. It has damaged the Jewish psyche. Because they have said, if there was a Messiah, we would, this would never have happened. But if the rabbis had been faithful in telling them what God said in the Bible, they would have said, well, that's what God said. If we didn't serve him, this is what would happen. Now, that's what Satan is setting up the Christians today for. By taking and way overstressing the goodness of God and way minimizing the severity of God, Satan knows there's a Gentile Holocaust coming. He knows that if the Jews suffered as they did, it's going to be ten times worse on the Gentiles. It's going to be a bloodbath we can't even imagine. And, and what Satan is doing, I believe, is the same thing that he did to the Jews. He's, he's getting us so, so, so minimal attention to the negative and so maximal attention to the positive that when this happens, people will just throw up their hands and say there is no God because it, it, the God would never do this to me. Instead of the preachers faithfully warning them, warning them, warning them that the book of Revelation says a third of the population shall die and, and all the different things that Jesus said about people. Woe unto you, Chorazin. Woe unto you, Bethsaida. Woe unto you. The men of Nineveh shall arise and, and so on. And, and all, the, all the warnings of the New Testament, including the book of Revelation, which are fearsome, fearsome. Uh, the things that will happen to people, where they end up in a kind of a hell's twilight filled with cancerous sores and are raging against God. I mean, preachers don't want to talk about that. But you see, it's coming. The Gentile Holocaust is coming because Romans says, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. The Jews have had their Holocaust Ours is coming. Now, if, if, if the people were prepared like this and accepted the fact that God is as severe as he is and has never changed, it was Jesus who dictated the curses on Mount Gerizim. It was Jesus who did that. Right? He's the God of the Old Testament. He was the God of Israel. And Yahweh, that's Jesus. And he was the one that said those things, and he hasn't changed. He hasn't changed. So that's one of the things that is why Satan, why our whole Christian doctrine is filled with the goodness of God and that we do nothing. All right, the second thing that I think is happening here is that in our day, we have uh, dispensationally, in, types of the, in terms of the types, we are moving past Pentecost, and the next thing after Pentecost was the forming of an army. That's the next thing after Pentecost was the forming of an army. And you see what is happening if we, can, if we can be led to believe that we do nothing but just rest in Christ for our salvation. Do you see what this impact this has as far as an army is concerned? 
there will be no army. And if there's anything Satan fears, it's God's people being disciplined and made into an army. And that is, I think, one of the other big reasons why we're having this tremendous emphasis across the country that you do nothing, that you do nothing. Now, the arguments are persuasive, but uh, uh, remember, this, this argument can be distilled down to this single small issue, two words, personal effort. That's where the, that's where the nucleus of the issue are Christians expected to exert personal effort? And if so, is it critical in their salvation? Did you see that? Are Christians expected to exert personal effort? And if so, is it critical to their salvation or just a nice thing that we ought to do? That's the issue. All right, now let's look and see. You don't need many scriptures, but I want to give you a couple. If somebody tells you that we Christians are not to do anything, that we are to rest in the sovereign finished work of God, I want you to have some scriptures to answer them because they don't use scripture, they use logic and deduction. And one really good is in Romans 12. What we're talking about now is, is human effort, personal effort involved in the plan of redemption or are we to rest in the finished work of Christ? Is there a place for personal effort? Now look at Romans 12.1. I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Well, it could be maintained. That's something that you do by faith. You just say, Jesus, take it. Okay, I understand. Holy and pleasing to God. But I would say this is something that you have to do. He says, I urge you to do this. All right. He says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Well, that's something we do. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's something God does. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. All right. Now notice. But by the grace given unto me, do not think of yourself more highly, and so on. Now, just as each of, one, each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, verse 5 of Romans 12, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. Now notice, and see if this sounds to you like personal effort. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Now, does that sound to you like we do something personally? Or do we wait for Jesus to do these things? What does it sound like? What do you think? I mean, these are only letters. This is something a guy sat down and wrote. Does that sound to you like something he expected those people to do? Or were they to read behind and second guess him and say, well, yes, we should do this, but we wait for Jesus to do it? Or do we use effort? What do you think? It's just the normal impact of the prose. What do you think? Doesn't it sound like something that you do? Would it be kind of stretching it to say, well, yes, but I must not do this until Jesus does it in me? But I'm re resting in him to work out his victory through me? Granted, granted that we can do nothing of ourselves and that we must pray for help. But that's what we do. We, we go forward. We say, okay, God said if I'm, I, my ministry seems to be mercy, Therefore, Lord, we begin to pray that God will open the door and help us. And we may find an opportunity to go work at an old folks home or in an orphanage. And we do this for maybe two months. And then all of a sudden something happens. We feel we should be doing it, but we're blocked in all kinds of ways. What do we do? We pray. Just like in Mexico, we seek the Lord. In other words, we are in motion, acting, overcoming going forward with the Lord, not waiting for a vision, not waiting for a feeling, not waiting for the Lord to move us, but we are doing what the Lord has commanded us to do. Is that right? Well, this is very important. I'll assure you a lot of people are being taught that you do not do anything, that Christ has done it all. 
Now, here's a way you can answer it with Romans 12. All right, let's look at 50, 1 Corinthians 15, 34. I've been very busy in the last month writing study guides for 1 and 2 Corinthians, and I'm very much into Paul's thinking in this, his attitude. 1 Corinthians 15, 34. Somebody has that, read it. All right. Now, if you were in Corinth and you were to read that where Paul said, uh, uh, by the way, verse 33 is interesting. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Watch the people you associate with. Now, this is very important what I'm telling you. If you're interested in the crown of glory and in overcoming and receiving the fullness of the inheritance, I'm telling you, watch who you associate with. Be careful. It is not an incidental thing that you can socialize with whomever you want. You be careful. That's what the Bible says. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. If there were no other verse, that would completely invalidate this overstress, this overemphasis on the finished work of Christ. Paul, a human being, under considerable duress, in prison, he had all kinds of things that was wrong in Corinth. He had a man living in incest with his stepmother, and the church is bragging about it instead of horrified. They had confusion about teachers. They had confusion regarding the over use of tongues in the assembling, all kinds of things that were going wrong in that church that he's rebuked them for, and this was one of them. They had left off lifting a godly life. He did not say to them, but it's all right, just rest because there's a finished work. He said, awake and stop your sinning. Do you see what I'm saying? This is something you do, but I thought only really Christ can do that. How many ever heard of the gospel of the shoes? You know, Job is shoed evil. Huh? That's the gospel of the shoes. That means when you know you're going to do something wrong, turn around in your shoes and go the other way. You see, if we try to make it all what we do, it won't work. If we try to make it all that Christ does, it will not work. It won't work. It's the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. He says, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread. We have to tread. We have to get up in the morning, put our hand to the plow, and say, Jesus, help me to find your will this day. It is a vigorous, active thing. We don't get voices. We don't get visions. We don't get a telegram. Most of the time, we're not sure of God's will. We don't know what's in the world, but we know that we're in a battle, we're in a race, and we get up and we move on in the Lord. We keep batting our head against the wall and making all kinds of mistakes, but somehow out of this, God works in our lives. And the opposite of that is to wait for God to do it. And I'm here to tell you, and it's a money-back guarantee, he will not do it unless you do your part. You know, if I were to wait to teach, that every time I felt God move on me to teach, you wouldn't even know me. I mean, I, by this time, I'd be a stranger. That's how often you'd see me. You get up and do what God has given you to do. And if you're in the Lord's will and doing his will, man, if I waited, you know, every time at home for God to give me a vision or to prompt me to come here, I'd be here on an average probably about three times a year. <laughs> you get up, whether you're sick or well, feel good or feel totally depressed, whatever else you do, you come and do the Lord's will. You don't wait for him to move. It doesn't work. God refuses to be forced into a situation where he has to work. He refuses to do that. 
He says, you do on, do your stumbling way, and I'll guide you, but I'm not going to be forced into a place where I have to work before you move. It will not work. It's going to lead people to destruction. I know that. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. I don't want to wait around to see them crash if we can be helped. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. <clears throat> Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we get it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave. Now, does that sound like somebody that's resting in the finished work of Christ? Well, I mean, it sounds funny, but people, you know, we just hear today, and I know the two people that quit taking the tapes. It's a shame. But they're hearing the doctrine that is saying to them, all this overcoming stuff and this serving the Lord and this, you know, uh, confessing your sins and all this, Christ has done it all. That's what they're hearing. It's a grief to my mind. You would think from these, just those scriptures they would see differently, but they don't go by the Bible. They, they create in your mind a picture, and that's the picture. It makes you feel good. And these things, they would have some explanation. I don't know what it would be. I don't much care. Galatians 5.24. I give my bread. I don't argue doctrine with anybody. They want to argue, fine. I say, okay, okay, just wait. We'll see in the end who's right. <laughs> Let it all come out in the wash. That's fine with me. I love it. I love it. We'll just wait till the day of judgment, and then we'll see who's right. But I win in that case. I'm trying to help people. Now wait till they find out the hard way. Galatians 5.24. Now, now, again, what we're talking about is the criti criticality, is that a word, of the criticalness of the role of human effort in our redemption and in overcoming. All right, Galatians 5.24. Uh, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Now, does that sound like something we do? Or something that God does while we wait? Now, listen. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the sinful nature. Who did it? Did Christ do it or did they do it according to the according to the prose here? Who did it? They did it. You say, how do we crucify our sinful nature? When we're tempted to do evil, we see what is right and wrong. Sometimes we're deceived. We make mistakes, okay? That's another issue. But when we know what is right and wrong, and we're tempted to do wrong, and we say within ourselves, I know what I should do, but I'm going to do the other. See, that's the issue. And when we say, nope, it's not pleasing to God, I know what I should be doing, I refuse to do this other, that's how you crucify your sinful nature. That's how you do it. And Jesus will not do it for you. He will hear you if you cry for help and say, Jesus, I'm not strong enough to do this. But you have to do that. You have to show your determination and do the best you can do, and then the Lord will help you. That's how it works. Anything else is passivity. 1 John 3, 3. And these are just a few. I'm not going to give you the whole book, but if you read the whole New Testament, you'll find out it's all works. But it's not the works of the law. Paul was talking about the works of the law. It's not the works of the law. It's the work that comes in Jesus. 1 John 3, 3. Now notice this. Okay. Everyone who has this hope in him, that is the hope of being like Jesus and seeing him. 
Everyone who has this hope in him does what? Who, purif who purifies him? How do we do that? You know, Audrey and I were talking today about old-fashioned holiness, and I want to tell you something. As far as I can see, the charismatic move, the aglow, by and large, these modern movements understand little or nothing about holiness. They do not understand holiness. Now, we were raised, Audrey and I, in holiness churches. We understand holiness. Now, was holiness overdone? Yes. They, the women had to ha have their hair done in a bun. I mean, you didn't. If you wasn't in a bun, you were a Jezebel. And the preacher's liable to call you out from the pulpit, too. They did not mince words. You were a Jezebel. You come into church with lipstick on, you were a Jezebel. You come in and your skirt was above your ankles, you were a Jezebel. That's the way it was. All right, but there was, but when, when they went into all this, the, uh, kind of a reaction against this external holiness. There was a reaction against it on the part of people. They became liberated or something. But they went too far. And the concept of holiness unto the Lord, you won't see it in the charismatic church. It, it, there's something lacking. The concept of prayer and holiness unto the Lord is not present. It's just not present. And the idea of purifying yourself, the idea of taking <clears throat> care to do what is clean and what is right and what is holy and attaching uh, importance to this and stress in this. There's not enough of it. And we threw out too much. We threw out too much. <clears throat> we are better off with the buns and the, and the bare faces, I do believe, because we've gone too far. Now anything goes. You, a woman can come to sh uh, church in shorts and, you know, I mean, it's... You know, but I don't want to get into that. I'm not a preacher about women's apparel uh, or men's apparel. They come in tank tops, and they, and they do sometimes. And we've had people do that. I never say a word about it. You give them 10 years, and they're in here in a business suit. God will do it. God will do it. You know, they come in afros and tight jeans. Just give them 10 years. They're in a business suit. You don't have to holler about preaching, about dress. But nevertheless, the idea of holiness unto the Lord. You know, that you can do foolishness, put foolishness on your answer machine. Ha, 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 all this and go and, and all your gay things that you go to and all this and everything. But in the old days in Pentecost, it wasn't like that. You had to live it straight down the line. And while it was external, there was strength there. And I think God honored it. I think God honored it. Andy and Judy used to be in the Nazarene movement, and they were tremendous for holiness. And the generation before you was tremendous in holiness. I mean, they were holiness people. You know, the charismatic move and the glow, as far as I can see, know nothing about holiness. It doesn't even, it isn't even in their vocabulary. When this says purify yourself, it's talking about a people who are always looking around to make sure what they're doing is pleasing to God. Some of them don't eat bacon, don't eat pork. The Bible doesn't condemn that. It says if, if they don't do it, then when you're in their house, don't do it. Don't cause them to stumble. Because these little things God honors, their faith and their desire to please him. Do you see that? And we say, oh, I know better than that. I can eat anything. You know, I can drink blood and eat, you know, whatever I want. And I could do all this. Paul says, that's fine. Have it under yourself. But, but their thing, and the, and the farmers, you know, they believe Sunday was the Sabbath day and you didn't work on the Sabbath day. They come in. That's incorrect theology. But God honored it. It was an attempt to be holy. And God honored it. And that we have far too little of that, far too little of that. God doesn't do that for you. You purify yourself. You do that. You decide what is holy, and you resist the unholy. You know, maybe you're used to reading a lot of stuff, and then you feel, what am I reading this stuff for? It's all worldly and everything else. And you quit it. God will honor it. You're taking a step in holiness. You figure this isn't pure. You take a step. People say, that's, and then, see, then, then in the current vernacular, if we stop reading, let's say we're reading uh, the Inquirer, some of the sleaze magazines th that are in the supermarket. Let's say we're reading some of the sleaze magazines, you know, all about what uh, Elizabeth Taylor does and all about uh, what the Queen of England does and all this stuff. We read a sleaze, okay? Then we, we think of the Lord, but this is a waste of my time. This isn't right, see? And we stop reading it. We just stop reading it. It's just not pleasing to the Lord. Okay. 
the modern vernacular now trend is to say, well, that's a pharisaical work. See, you're trying, to, you're trying to do something of yourself. You're not resting in the finished work of Christ. Can you see how deadly that is? You see that? And that will frustrate the building of God's army. God wants us always looking for ways to redeem the time. Always looking for ways to redeem the time. And as you watch, when you start off, you're a merry Christian, you go along in your car and everything, as you become seasoned, you learn to use that time to pray. You can drive and pray. You can drive and pray. Your life begins to pick up in holiness. Jesus doesn't do this for you. You do this because you love him and because you want to serve him and you want to grow in him. And he rewards you. And the results, and then the idea comes, well, it isn't that we'll lose anything. We do it because we love him. That won't work either because you will not make those kind of efforts unless you fear God and believe there's a critical difference. And you watch people that say, well, I know I'm saved and nothing can happen about it and Jesus did it, but I ought to do good. You watch those people. Just watch them. And when they are tested severely enough, they will fall because they do not have the fear of God. I fear God. I can't even relate to people. There, listen, there's people that say this, and they are not uncommon. Good people, decent people that love God and serve him. But their statement is, I know that even if I don't, God would never punish me. Now, I can't even relate to that. Do I criti I don't criticize the people. I try to ponder human thinking and the going and the ways of people because my bag, as I said, is doctrine. That's what God has given me to do, is to teach doctrine to the church. That's all I've ever done. That's, that's what I am. That's it. <laughs> you know, what you see is what you get. And uh, I'm going to be true to what God has given me because it's important and it will help people now and in the future. But I can't relate to someone who says, even if I don't serve God, I know that he would save me anyway because he loves me. I can't even relate to that because in my thing, if I don't give to what God has given me, if I don't give my time to it without distraction, if I spend my time on my hobbies, which I very well could, master the piano, which is something I'll have to do in the next world because there's no time in this one. I can't master the piano and serve this congregation. I can't do a lot of the things I would like to do and serve this congregation. And if I'm not true to the word that God has given me, brother, sister, I'm going to catch it, and it isn't going to be pretty. And I know it, and I fear God. And, and, and you know, the fear of God has been driven out of the churches. And people say these things, it's because they're ignorant of spiritual reality. Whenever people say, well, even though I didn't serve God, I know he loves me, and, and I, they do not understand the scripture or spiritual reality. They're going to be held to strict account for everything that they've had and for some that they haven't. And I'll show you that in a minute. Let's look at Matthew 25, verse 24. Behold the goodness and severity of God. Now, here, I hope you're writing them down like Debbie and Rebecca are. Because you're going to be approached with this doctrine. You're going to be approached with this in the most winsome ways by skillful people. And if you let them take your crown, you will, you will hear no, you will have no one to blame in the day of the Lord but yourself. I want to tell you another thing too. He that loves father or mother, brother or sister, wife or husband, more than me, is not worthy of me. And let that sink down into your ears. And if someone came to me and said, my wife or my husband will not stay with me if I attend that kind of preaching, and they come to me and say, what should I do? I'll say to them, go with your wife, go with your husband because I'll not be here to, uh, responsible for dividing anybody's family. But when you go to Jesus, you better be prepared. Whenever God 
shows you something on the horizon of your life, truth. That is the most valuable thing you'll ever have. And you have got to sell all to buy it. And people today are taking it all together too lightly and they're putting all kinds of things ahead of it. And people have come to me, have come to me, and they have said, my wife will not put up with that. And if I come, I lose my wife and kids. And I said to them, go with your wife because I'll not be responsible <laughs> to break up anybody's home. But let me tell you something. The Lord says, you had truth and you loved your wife or your hu husband or your son or your daughter more than that truth. You're not worthy of it and you will lose it. Let it sink down into your ears. It's the truth. We're not geared or braced at all nearly enough for the stringency of the Word of God. We think it's something that's all right so long as it works, but if critical things intervene where I want to live, my job, my family, they come first, and then if it works, It's the truth. I didn't say it. God said it. He's not worthy of me. Matthew 25. And you know the story of the talents. Verse 19. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. We're talking about masters and servants. We're not talking about the unsaved, are we? We're talking about God's servants. Jesus is talking about his servants, is that right? We think this is the unsaved when we get sense to us. All right. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Now, just off the top, does that sound like to you that he was resting in the finished work of his master? Was this the issue or was it that he himself personally exerted himself to do something with what he had? Personal exertion personal responsibility and the criticalness of the consequences is what I'm talking about. Are they critical or not? Or do we rest in the finished work regardless of what we do? Very important. It may seem monotonous and unnecessary for, you to re for me to keep repeating this. It is not. It is going on the tape. It is nationwide. It is destructive. All right? His master replied, all right, the man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. You entrusted me with two talents. You gave me two talents. I have gained two more. I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man. Now that's more than people know today. They have rejected that, <coughs> rejected that. How many have read the book Angels on Assignment? It's a story of a, uh, an Assembly of God pastor by the name of Buck, a fairly large church. An experienced pastor, seasoned. This took place about 13 years ago. Two angels came and visited this pastor in a very real way. They petted his dog. They, they talked to him. They did different things. They worshipped in his presence, and he found that he was uh, several feet off the floor while they were worshipping. So he would be at the level with the angels. All kinds of miracle things. Now, here was an experienced, seasoned Assembly of God pastor. One angel said he was Gabriel and the other Michael. Now, 
That alone should have cued him because whenever Gabriel and Michael appear, and they appear very seldom, they are epical changes in the church. They've never appeared together. And when they do, they are things on the level of the birth of Christ. I mean, they don't appear in the bedroom of some assembly god pastor and pet his dog. He was a seasoned man, seasoned man. And what these angels taught him was the traditional evangelical line, the rapture. The one thing that stuck in my mind was one of the angels said to him to, to get off the negative and to prove this, he said, now, for example, if you purchased a dishwasher, you would use it. You wouldn't get down on your hands and knees and look for the warning. And the idea was you don't go into the warnings of the Bible. You don't get on hands and knees and see, you know, don't stand in a bucket of water and turn on the dishwater, dishwasher. Right? You, you just take for granted, okay, so there's a negative part, but you don't spend your time on it. You spend your time. You see that? These two angels. He wrote a book called Angels on Assignment. It swept the charismatic world. I mean, it just swept the charismatic world. I got it, pushed it in the church, said this is tremendous, you know, Angels, praise the Lord. I, you know, it's anything going. I want to be part of it. I believe it. And then at, right at that time, I went to Iceland, and I was shut off uh, in a room, shut off by the language barrier, just praying, 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 ministering twice a day. And during that time, the, some of the words in the book came back to me. One was a passage in Corinthians that said, Judge nothing before the time uh, until the Lord come, and then every man shall have praise of God. Well, if you know the Bible and you know the text of what that's saying, that's saying don't judge people for the wrong things that you think they may have done or they may not have done. You don't know their motives. So do not judge them, Paul said, before the time of the Lord come, which is a good admonition for us because you don't know what happened. You don't know people's motives. He said, when the Lord comes, every man shall have praise of God. Well, that doesn't mean that every man's going to be praised when the Lord comes, obviously. It means that, that each man that has done right will get his reward when the Lord comes, and you don't have to worry about it. But the angels interpreted it that every man, every Christian will be praised by God. Well, I knew that was wrong. I knew that was not right, see. But that's current evangelical teaching, that it's, that it's a sports award banquet and everybody gets some kind of a prize, honorable mention or something. Well, anyway, it, when I came back, I said, the book is wrong. The doctrine is wrong. Even one wrong thing like that, that's not in Gabriel and Michael. See, and come to find out, he'd come here to Escondido and, and stress the rapture. And there was people from this church there who never said a word. He just, just, he, in fact, he said, does anybody not believe in the rapture? Well, how could they answer? I mean, you've got Gabriel and Michael going for you, you know, pretty heavy. Well, fortunately for him, he had a heart attack then and died because that was not God. And that whole book was not God. What it was was Satan giving Inspiration to this idea, shun the negative, stress the positive. Everyone's going to get praise of God. See? No hard man to it. What's the hard man to it? See, that's what Satan's after. He's good. He's good. And then when the Gentile Holocaust comes, the Christians will be totally unprepared. And they will do like the Jews have done, lose their faith in God. That's what he's after, people. Okay. We've been warned. He said, I know that you, I knew that you are a hard man harvesting where you have not sown. That's what I meant by saying he'll hold you accountable for the stuff he's giving and some he hasn't. Huh? In other words, he wants interest. He wants interest. He wants gain from your life. Can you see that this is in total contradistinction to the idea that it's a finished work, he's done it all and we're complete in him? Can you see that this is in total contradistinction to that? See that? It's the opposite. It is human responsibility with terrific consequences if we don't do it. And gathering where you have not scattered seeds. So I was afraid. I think sometimes people are moved by fear. And when you say that uh, their, re their, their responses have consequences, they, they can't stand it. And so 
the preachers have provided for them a security that is not in the scripture. It doesn't matter, honey. God loves you. It's going to come out. In, in their attempt to make frightened people secure, they have changed the word of God. And that's not a good way to make people secure. It's to change the word. But rather to encourage them that if they will seek the Lord, he will take them through their present problem. Not if you don't. See, that's, that, that is not it. The Lord will not honor that. I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. That's very much like this finished work kind of idea. It's your talent. I did nothing. Here, you have what is yours. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied. Now, this is Jesus talking to a Christian. This is Jesus, master and servants. Nothing to do with the unsaved. He's talking here to his disciples, to the Jews. He's talking to his people. You wicked. Now, what did, they, what did this man do that was wicked? <laughs> he, he, he certainly didn't commit any crime against the Ten Commandments. He didn't commit adultery. He didn't steal. He didn't lie. He didn't hurt anyone wicked. We would call this kind of a person a kind of a diffident, maybe timid. We would call him timid. But the Lord called him wicked. The Lord is not amazed or amused with timidity because it prevents us from taking our stand. Wicked. Then he accuses him of something else. Lazy. Now, I ask you, does the word lazy impact on this idea of human effort? Well, I think rather directly. Rather directly. Lazy implies that you were not motivated enough to do anything with the responsibility to hand. Laziness is a terrible thing, isn't it? I can't stand it personally, so I really am not a big help around lazy people because it's, it's something that, I guess it's my New England background. I want to see everybody working as hard as they can work and harder than they can work all the time at all times. That's my problem. But I don't like laziness. Per well, that's, that's personal. Back to the word. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then... You should have, in that case, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. You should have done this. I'm not going to do this for you. You should have done it. Fair? Fair interpretation? Huh? It'd be pretty hard to contradict that, wouldn't it? Okay? Take the talent from him. This is a poor dude. has one little old talent. You know, now he's got nothing. Take it from him. What did he do? Didn't he believe? What is faith? Well, he believed the fellow was a hard man, but he believed that if he saved it for him, he would still have it. So his faith was misdirected. <coughs> his problem was he didn't do. He didn't act in terms of his belief. I knew you're a hard man. I knew that you wanted interest but I did nothing about it. How then can we say that Christ did it all? How can we say that without bringing in another gospel? How can we say it in the face of Scripture? Awake to righteousness, sin not. Purify yourself. Crucify the flesh with its deeds. And 300 more, which you don't want to hear tonight. Okay? Take the talent from him. Now we're talking about consequences. Will my not exerting myself personally have really critical consequences or does God love me anyway? That's the second issue. I said first, is personal effort required? And secondly, how critical is it that we do it? Okay? I told you the game plan to begin. All right? Now let's see if, if in your opinion... Oh, wouldn't this be a honey over there in your school? Wouldn't this be a honey? Wow. Let's see then if it has critical consequences. 
Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. Now, what do we learn about the industrious, vital believer who is always about the Lord's business, doing things? And what does it say about him? He, he's going to get more. And the Lord rewards the industry. The Lord rewards industry. And that person, he's everything the Lord has given him, he's put to use. He's put it to use, Stan. Man, the Lord gives us stuff, puts it to use. Gives him the gift of faith, puts it to use. Gives him the ability to teach, puts it to use. Gives him the ability to help people, puts it to use. Every time the guy turns around, he's using what God has given him. Because if that's the case, it'd be a smart move on my part to give him something else. I can get more out of this guy. <laughs> Isn't that right, Mark? If you can turn out 10 units an hour, boy, they'll be after you for 11. All right, that's the way that goes. All right. For everyone who has, see, everyone who has received from the Lord and is making that count will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, that is, his life has been barren. And I think if people wait for Jesus to do it all, their life is going to be barren. No, no, that isn't what's going to happen. I tell you what is going to happen. They're going to use their creative efforts. Instead of using them in godly things, they are going to be turned to destruction. Now, let me say that again. People who do not seek the Lord and do his will as they should, use their efforts, their mentality, their emotions, their physical strength and their time to serve in God, will use that doing things that will tear down the kingdom, and you watch it happen. They will not stay neutral. They will go and attack the godly. And watch it. Because the passivity that is in them will make room for Satan, and he will go after the godly. You watch it happen. They will not do nothing. People aren't made that way. Because they have not done the righteous they will do the unrighteous. And it is already happening, and I know it firsthand. And it's terrible. Terrible. And it is dividing homes because the people now are acting out evil because they have rejected the righteousness. So they are acting out evil. It's already happening, even at this pure, premature stage. It hasn't anywhere developed the, the lawlessness that will come forth from this doctrine. Whoever does not have and throw that worthless servant outside. Here's a person who has done nothing. He has not exerted himself. He has not taken what has been given to him and gone out and used it in the marketplace. Does this lack of effort have significant results or did the master love him anyway? As is so commonly taught, unconditional love, unconditional love is not true. It is not of God. It is a humanistic concept. God's love always is conditional. And this is a case in point that is extremely clear. This man had not rebelled against his God in a direct way. He had not denounced God. He had not blasphemed the name of God. He had not made a graven image. He had not committed adultery. His only Crime was lack of personal effort. That's all that went wrong here. Did it have significant consequences? Throw that worthless, worthless. How would you like to have God call you worthless? I mean, that's quite an adjective. That doesn't sound like unconditional love to me. And it doesn't sound like that 
our lack of effort has no serious consequences. We'll just get an uh, honorable mention instead of a uh, gold cup, which is taught. Outside, into the darkness, take him, throw him. And here, these mighty angels. You ever see the Lord going in his glory? I had a glimpse of that one time. Whoa, man. The majesty of the king and all his advisors around him and the guards and the mighty men. As Jesus goes, you know, as it says in Proverbs, that's one of the majestic things to see is the going of a king. I saw that just a little bit for Jesus. And I could hardly bear the sight. My heart smote within me. Uh, you know, it's a wonder my knees didn't knock because of the majesty of the king as he went with all these holy, tremendous beings around him. The king the king of glory. And he turned and he looked at this man. Worthless. Worthless. You knew I was a hard man. You knew I gathered where I haven't sown, where I haven't laid down and reaped where I haven't sown. You knew that and yet you buried the thing. What do you think I am? Don't you believe what I am? You didn't even act in terms of your own understanding of me. You're worthless. You're worthless. Take him. Here come these mighty angels dragging this screaming Christian into the darkness. This is talking about Christians. And what do they do there? Play Monopoly? There shall be weeping. Weeping! I said that the reason the Jews have fallen away is they weren't warned by their rabbis of the severity of God. Because it's so easy for a minister to say nice things, smooth things. This is a nice church and a nice minister. And he says nice things. Why well, doesn't me? I'm warning you so that when you see the judgment that's going to be visited on America, I tell you the blood of every single aborted fetus is crying unto God from the ground. Amen. Amen. And God knows their names. Every last one of those little aborted organisms, God knows their name. Their blood cries unto God from the ground. We were not given our chance to live, oh God. And you imagine what it will be like when God decides to judge America and all that this fellow had done was just said let him do it all do you know how much grief and torment and fear and dread you have to be in to gnash your teeth there shall be weeping God said and my servants in the outer darkness but our preachers told us it was unconditional grace and it was uh, irresistible grace and unconditional love and all this where are they that taught me this? And now here I am uh, surrounded by demons and black, blackness and darkness and fallen lords and I, and I can see the great golden gates and I can hear the voice of the children and the music and see the glory of the Lamb and His bride and I'm out here and the doors are closing and it may be forever. There shall be weeping and gnashing Teeth. And when Jesus says, he that loves father or mother, wife or husband, brother or sister, son or daughter more than me, is not worthy of me. And if God has given you truth, and you insist on letting people talk you out of it, you will answer to a hard Lord. Now, I've been a faithful friend to you. I've been a faithful friend to you. Regardless of your feelings, I have told you the truth from God's holy word. It has cost me. Now, don't let people steal it. Don't be careless and lazy and slowful and neglect the most important thing in your life. Shall we stand?